This is an introductory lecture on identifying clusters in ArcGIS 10.2. I'm going to give a short overview about how cluster analysis works in ArcGIS, and then I'm going to talk about the data you'll need to do a series of tutorials. There'll be three of them, and they are in three separate videos. So when we identify clusters, uh, what we mean by that is that we're interested in identifying geographic distributions of uh, features in which, in which you have a situation of a critical number of features in close proximity to one another. Uh, and that kind of implies two, two elements. One, that there's some critical distance at which uh, features are considered part of a cluster. And secondly, that there's a, a certain number of features that qualify as a cluster. Secondly, cluster analysis can also mean finding groups of features with similarly high or low values. Um, so your idea, when you talk about hotspots, you're talking about places where you find uh, features that are in close proximity to one another and of similar values. And those similar values could, again, be either high or low. And in fact, that's actually the more common way that we understand uh, to identify um, hotspots or clusters. The cluster analysis process uh, follows uh, a basic series of steps. Um, some of this you might need to do manually, or at least you'll need to use the tools uh, individually. Uh, but increasingly, there are automated tools that can do this. Essentially, the first thing that you do when you're looking for cluster analysis in any kind of data set, any kind of geographic data set, is to start with a basic global statistic that looks across the entire data set. And in ARC, you have two options for that. You, ha you have either the global Moran's I or the Geddes or General G, both of which tell you um, whether or not there is clustering or spatial autocorrelation occurring uh, anywhere in the data set, but they don't necessarily tell you where. But it's a quick way of assessing um, whether or not there's anything worth pursuing, whether analyzing further. Secondly, um, if you decide to pursue the analysis of spatial autocorrelation with the intention of identifying where in the data set um, you are seeing clusters of some sort, you have to determine a scale or a critical distance at which to do the analysis. Because essentially what happens with the cluster analysis process is that um, the computer is looking to identify which neighboring features or which neighborhood uh, are relevant in the analysis. Because essentially most of these statistics work by comparing any given feature to its surrounding features or its neighbors. So the question is, what qualifies as a neighbor or a neighborhood? So the way that we determine this, well, there's a couple ways. One is that you could choose that neighborhood distance, that uh, scale, based on a theoretical understanding of the topic. So for example, if we were talking about a form of disease and we knew that the disease had a particular um, uh, uh, life cycle and it would only last for so long, it could only travel so far, uh, we would say that, well, it can't go further than 24 hours and then you could uh, convert that time into some kind of physical distance as a way of interpreting and saying that would be qualify as a relevant neighborhood. But when you don't know or don't have a, a clear sense of what that would be, then you want to turn to tools that look at the data itself to identify uh, at which distance um, you find a maximization of spatial autocorrelation or, or, or an indication of clustering. And so in that case you could imply the Ripley's K function or the incremental global Moran's I tool, both of which will identify um, autocorrelation at various distances at, and then you can analyze and look at that to see at what point you find a maximization of a spatial autocorrelation, usually uh, a high z-score, right, a high deviation from the assumption of randomness and your statistic to uh, to start with. So once you've determined the critical distance, then you can go straight to the local statistics, and you have a local Moran's I and the local Geddes or GI star tools. Local meaning that it's going to be applying these and computing these statistics uh, for each of the features in your data set. Whereas a global statistic gave you one number for the entire data set as an assessment of spatial autocorrelation, the local statistic gives you a number for each feature, which then allows you to visually inspect it and see where in your data set the hotspot, hotspots uh, or clusters are. Um, when you interpret those numbers, it's important to keep in mind what the statistic is telling you. And in almost all cases, the, st the statistic, the significantly, statistically significant areas that you identify uh, are, are 
areas that are statistically different from the assumption of a random assortment of your data, as if the va feature values or the features themselves were spread across your analysis area randomly, how different is your data from that assumption of randomness? Uh, and a lot of times that random assumption is, is a little too simple. Uh, it's not really a reflection of reality because we know that uh, the underlying uh, sp spatial phenomena are often a function of un other factors that are going on, on the ground. So if you're looking at emergency calls, for example, um, it may be that they're less a reflection of anything happening in a particular area and more the fact that you get more emergency calls where you have more people. So maybe looking at the um, hot spots and spatial autocorrelation of Emergency calls should also be compared to a, a similar analysis of population distribution, because if if you're simply seeing the two the, the two are the same, then you're not really finding a hotspot in any kind of significant way. But if they deviate, then you might have something going on there. So, just as a way of keeping in mind uh, what it is that you what's being reported, you can't take the um, statistics too literally. You have to take them in context and ideally compare them against some kind of control feature that would allow you to uh, determine whether or not you're seeing some kind of independent phenomena or whether it's really just a reflection of something else, some other process that's happening in your data. Okay. There's several tools that we're going to look at in this series of tutorials that will follow this video. Um, there's three in particular that we're looking at. The first one is the cluster and outlier analysis, local Moran's I. Uh, which allows you to identify um, clusters in terms of cold spots and hot spots. Hot spots are areas where you have features that have similarly high values. Cold spots are features that have similarly low values. And outliers are features that uh, have values that differ significantly from the features around them. So in, in case you might have a census tract or a, a town maybe that has a low median income but surrounded by other features with high median incomes and so that's that's what's considered an outlier so we'll be using that tool um, when we use this tool there's a few basic uh, best guidelines uh, that kind of guide our, our use of it um, we have to have at least 30 features and this is kind of like a rule of thumb for using uh, inferential statistics in general that you want to have at least 30 features um, with geographic data sets usually that's not a problem in fact you usually have the opposite problem you have too many features which can actually inflate the um, statistical significance and there are actually uh, parameters in some of the tools that allow you to control for that which I'll, I'll uh, mention later. Um, in all cases when you do a cluster analysis uh, the features that you're analyzing have to have an attribute value to do the cluster analysis so that there has to be a number behind each point uh, in order to do this analysis. It, has to, it could be a count, a rate, or some other kind of measurement but there has to be something there. Um, um, when you're doing these analysis, you're going to be asked to select a, a spatial relationship, which essentially is a, a parameter that specifies how the neighbor, how neighbors relate to one another. So, for example, the simplest one would be an inverse distance relationship, in which case you you specify that features that are closer have a bigger influence or bigger impact than features that are further away. So that assumes a kind of a constant rate of distance decay, we call it. Alternatively, for example, when you're dealing with um, uh, polygons that are uh, uh, contiguous, you might consider a neighbor um, to be only those polygons that are uh, contiguous or, or contiguous with the, with the target feature. So in this case, if you were looking at a town or a, a census tract, you'd only consider towns or census tracts that touch a boundary or a corner as being relevant neighbors. Um, in that case, it's a very different way of assessing what qualifies as a neighborhood. So the choice of that should really be dictated by the type of data you're working with and the type of phenomenon that you're trying to analyze. And there's no quick answer to that. There are some rules of thumb, uh, but you might need to look more closely into your data and uh, to understand what would make sense. Lastly, there's, of course, the issue of selecting an appropriate distance band or threshold distance, and I already mentioned that, that there are different tools to kind of help you go there, as well as a theoretical, theoretical consideration about what might make sense. But at the very least, in terms of computing a, a valid statistic, um, you, want, you want all your features to have at least one neighbor. So you want to look for a distance that will, will accommodate that, because when you have uh, features that are lacking a neighbor, it affects the validity of, of the statistic that's being computed.
Um, you don't want to pick a distance O that is so large that all the features in your data set are the neighbor of any given feature, um, because then that just uh, it, 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 it defeats the purpose of trying to find a localized hotspot. Um, in general, you're trying to find, you'd like to have each feature to have um, um, several neighbors uh, rather than just one, uh, and definitely not none. Um, and so the number of neighbors um, be can become critical if the attribute values of those features are, are, um, have large magnitude differences. So if there's really large variation in the attributes, then you want to kind of um, moderate that with more neighbors. Uh, but if there isn't the case, uh, it's not such a big deal. Um, so in addition to the, ans the local Anselm um, Moran tool to look for um, hotspots and outliers, the Get Us or GI star statistic is another common tool that we can use. And this one focuses on identifying just the cold spots and the hot spots. Uh, and it works very similarly. It's a little more robust than the, Moran, the local Moran's eye in some respects. Um, but um, as far as the choice of use, um, the uh, Get Us or GI star statistic um, reports just the hot spot and cold spots, whereas the Moran's eye also will report the outliers. So that's kind of a, a difference. Lastly, um, there's a new tool that comes in 10.2 called the Optimized Hotspot Analysis, and that tool will let you automate a lot of the processes. But I'll get to that last, and it'll be in the last video. And uh, what this one is really important for is that it allows us to do a hotspot analysis when we just have incident point data. That is to say, points where we don't have attribute values. Um, and that's a special case because, as I said earlier, uh, all of the cluster analysis tools require that you have some kind of attribute, attribute value. So what the optimized hotspot analysis tool does, in addition to automating a lot of things, is that it um, gives you several options for aggregating the points in order to create an attribute value, which essentially is a count of the points. And we'll look at that in more detail uh, in the uh, following videos. Okay. In order to proceed with the videos, you're going to need the data to do, if you want to follow along with the exercises, and I've made that data available in Canvas. So when you're in the Canvas site for the class, if you go to the File section, you'll find um, that there is an Exercises folder, and if you look in the Exercises folder, there will be an esripress.zip file, a zipped file that contains all the data you'll need in the maps to follow along with the tutorial. So you need to download that and unzip it to a clean directory and it'll create the folder structure that you need. Um, just a warning here, it would be ideal to put this file somewhere um, higher up in your directory structure. So you don't want it buried too deep in your computer and you ideally don't want it buried uh, into a folder structure where you have too many, we have spaces in the names of the folders. Um, ESRI, uh, if you haven't learned already, kind of has a throwback problem with that. It, it, it kind of uh, chokes sometimes when you're working with certain kinds of data when you have spaces in the names of um, the files or directory names. So just a warning there. So that's what you need and then uh, you can proceed with the uh, tutorials in the following videos.